how many of you in here are biologists? Raise your hand. Oh, you're so going to love this. Because <laughs> this is going to be all about biology. This actually gets you to um, test your skills at being a real astrobiologist because you need to try to step into a whole other discipline because we're going to go pretty deep into some biology. So today is the second part of the course, my part of the course, and we're going to talk about biology and astrobiology, bottom up and top down. So anybody have any idea what I mean by that? Yesterday we talked about, yeah, origins of life, right? So we can look at origins of life in two different ways. We can look at it from the top down, which would mean what? Looking at it from you sitting here and everything in the planet, looking at it from that, or go from the bottom up, trying to figure out what, have might, what might have been in the very beginning before there was anything, any life at all. So you, I'm prejudiced towards the bottom, I mean the top down approach, because that's what my whole career was about. So that's what we're gonna really look into in great detail. I don't know. How do I turn it on? One thing I didn't test. What is this a picture of? I don't know. I found it on Google. <laughs> I thought it looked cool. I'm sure it's an artist's rendition of something. What do you think it is, Charlie? There it is. Yeah, sulfurish. All right, so origin of life on Earth, you can look at, so we're going to talk about the top-down part of it. You can look at extant life and try to go backwards. And this is the whole area that encompasses phylogenetics. Um, have any of you in here done 23 and Me? One, two, no one else, no one else? Not the com well, any company that actually looks at your genome. Anybody in here looked at your genome? All right. So what did they tell you? You get announcements every so often that says what? They ask you whether your earlobes are attached. Yeah, they ask you if your earlobes are attached. They're trying to collect data, but they, they do something else. They usually say, well, we have found that you have X number of relatives that are now part of this big consortium of data that we've got, right? Phylogenetics is ex basically the very same thing. All we're doing is we're taking DNA sequences and we're comparing them like 23andMe does or Ancestor.com or any of those, and we're looking to see who's most related to the other person and how far back. We try to go backwards in time. Just like if... Um, if you're a young person and there is an older person like me who does their DNA and it turns out we're related, then we actually understand sort of a, a, a backwards in time association. Does that make sense? All right. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit, um, this is historical, you've heard about this before, but I think it's important, especially if you're not in the field of biology, to just see how, imp how amazing it was how this whole phy phylogenetics approach got started. So of course we're gonna talk about the three domains of life, but there was something, there was something intuitive about that three domains of life, that if you're doing that tree, you're doing that branch, you're doing that family history, you're doing phylogenetics, that says we might be able to understand what the last common ancestor of all of life looked like. So that's how we got to thinking about the origin of life, right? So to, to, to go back to 23andMe, if, if you and your sister and all of your relatives, you go back, see how far back you can go, and then everybody who does that actually is part of royalty, right? That's a joke. Everybody, <laughs> everybody who does their genealogy in, the, in America seems like they when, they, when they go back and find out that they were related to some king in England or in Spain or something. When I went back in my family, we never were related to anybody important. So <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. Um, so anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about this. So what we're, what we're referring to here then is we're going to look at this part 
of this huge timeline of Earth's history and try to assess what happened. Wait a minute, let me see. Try to assess what happened back here at the origin of life. Now, I, I'm, I'm using this visual on purpose to make you realize just how big this, this job is. I mean, we're talking about a long time. I don't even know how to think about four billion years. I don't know how to think about that. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, if I live to be a hundred, that's amazing. I don't know about a billion years. So the thing that the, the thing that became very important in this whole search was you're going to have to have something, some kind of fingerprint, some kind of molecule, something that is common across all of life in order to make these kind of estimations. You can't you can't take an apple and compare it to an orange and figure out who that relative is. You have to have something common between those. So anybody know what this is? I love this. We talked yesterday about ribozymes. This is a ribosome. Do anybody know what the ribosome does? If you're not a biologist, I'm not surprised if you don't know what this is, but maybe some of you do. You do, don't you? What does it do? It produces, proteins. produces proteins. What are proteins? What would you say? Yeah, come on, y'all know what proteins are. Did you eat an egg this morning? Did you have beans this morning? Do you have skin that sloughs off? All of those are part of proteins. So proteins are sort of what everything is that makes you up, and it's all dictated by your DNA. And the molecular machine, the most amazing invention or innovation in evolution was this little molecular machine right here that does that. It takes the information from the DNA through an intermediary called RNA, reads it and spits out proteins. And it's what makes you, it's if you get a, if you get a cut, if you tear a muscle, your body then re repairs it using this little molecular machine and you have a bunch of them in every cell. It uses this mo molecular machine to actually do that. Everything on this planet has this same business plan. Everything. I don't care what you come up with. Everything on this planet, whether it's a microbe, whether it's a staff in the back of your throat, whether it's an archaebacteria, whether it's an extremophile, they all have these ribosomes in them. Oh, yes, well, yeah, okay. That's actually excellent because I don't think of anything, I don't think his viruses is living, but you're exactly right. But he's exactly right. Viruses don't have this. So how many of you got COVID in here? Not right now, I hope you don't have it right now. But did you get COVID? Did you have COVID? Raise your hand if you had COVID. I had COVID. Viruses don't have this machine. They have to co-opt your machinery in your cells to be able to do this copying and th this, this making of proteins, making their own proteins. They go in and, I don't want to use the word sabotage because that's not really accurate, but they go in and they utilize your machinery in order to make more copies of themselves. Hijack. They hijack. Hijack it is a good thing. But, you know, and there, there's something interesting about that. Um, this is a sidebar. If it's too good at hijacking, your system, then it can't promote more of itself down the road. So evolution for viruses actually has this sort of balance it has to it has to do. It has to be able to hijack you, but not so much that you die so that it can't make more copies of itself. So there's a reason why sometimes as, as viral um, evolution goes on that it doesn't become more lethal. It becomes more contagious but not necessarily more lethal. It's just better for it. Not, it doesn't do that intentionally. It doesn't have a, doesn't have a psyche or a mind. <laughs> All right. So this, the curious thing about this is, and this was part of that RNA world stuff we talked about yesterday, is that the whole thing 
is made up. It's it the structure, the 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 meats, the meat of it is really RNA. It's pieces of RNA with proteins around it to protect it. So it's it's a it's a molecular machine that reads RNA that makes proteins that's made out of RNA and made with proteins. All right. So in that, what we can find. Sort of the gold standard in doing phylogenetics is to look at a particular piece of RNA in that ribosome. And it's, it's, it's called the 16S piece of that. And that's because of, the, of its weight is the reason why it's called that. You don't have to remember that. But if you go on to a public site called PubMed and you ask to find out how many, how many of this particular piece of RNA have been sequenced, you'll find over 2 million. It's easy to sequence. It's 1,600 bases long, which means it's 1,600 letters. For you non-biologists, there's a four-letter alphabet, A, C, G, and U. So there's, there's 1,600, roughly 1,600 of them. And everything on the planet, except for viruses, has this this particular piece of RNA in the ribosome. And there are places that are highly conserved, and there are places that are not highly conserved. So what you can do is you can compare this across all of life, except for viruses, and you can see which ones are more related to, any, to another one. It's, it's just simple. It's just, that's just what it means. It just means if I look to see what's similar, and in those variable regions, maybe actually look to see what's similar in a subgroup, then I can get to see, I can understand the, the family history of all of life. I think that's incredible. I mean, previous to this understanding, previous to us being able to sequence this, the way we looked and categorized things was just how they looked morphologically. Well, that bird looks kind of like those dinosaur fossils that we've seen, so those are kind of similar. You know, cows look like horses that look like, not quite like humans, but and orangutans look more like humans. That's the way we categorize things. Once we could do this, then we can categorize everything in a more accurate manner, what seems to be more genetically reasonable. So this is a flattened out version of that piece of RNA. It's a flattened out version. This is what the data looks like. This is what, you know, <laughs> so there's a reason why I went into bioinformatics. I'd like to tell you it was because, you know, I really had lots of computer skills and everything. What really is the truth, I tried to go into the molecular biology lab. I'm a great cook. Come to my house, I'll make you great food. Because I go to that kitchen, you know, and I just put things in here and put things in here and taste this a little bit. No, it needs a little bit more at the back of the tongue. Trust me, you can't do that in molecular biology lab. I sucked at molecular biology lab. So I decided to go into computers because they didn't care how many you know, times I made a typo or anything else. But this is, this is what we do. We sit at the computer and we line up areas that are the same and look for the areas that are not the same. So you see how this is consistent here, but this has a different, this has a different, we just make sure we align them. Now one of the things that happened in this field when I was starting out was 1,600 units, 1,600 bases, it's not that big of a problem, but if you're doing 1,000 of them and aligning them, that turns out to take a whole lot of time. So the computer science people said, we can fix that for you. We can actually align them ourselves. We'll do it automatically. The biology people said, mm -hmm, yeah, that's good, but we got to go back and check everything by hand because we know how the biology works here. So it was, a, it was a great time to either be in computer science or biology because we all had to work together. But that gives you an idea. And <coughs> I wanted to tell you, you know what, how many of you remember I told you I hated Wikipedia? Do you know why I hate Wikipedia? It's a love-hate relationship. Have any of you tried to edit Wikipedia? Raise your hand if you've edited Wikipedia. Did you have a good, did you have a good time doing it? No. I rest my case. <laughs> One other person didn't have a good time. Do you, know what, <laughs> do you know what Wikipedia's main 
standard is. Anybody know what that is? If you want to edit Wikipedia and you want to offer references, you understand how important references in, are in your career, right? So if you're going to reference something in a paper, what do you normally do? Going to have a reference. Do you go to the opinion piece that came out of science or do you go to the original article? Those, those have a name. So it's a first order reference or a second order reference or a third order reference. So you're going to always go to the original article to see what the original article actually said. Is that not correct? Anybody else do anything different? I mean, you might look at an opinion piece, but most of the time you're going to go directly to the article that stated whatever the results were. Wikipedia won't accept that. They use secondary and tertiary references because they think first, first primary references are biased by the person who actually did the work and they don't know what they're talking about. They need somebody else to have an opinion. How'd they come up with it? I don't know. I mean, science has never worked on that. And I'm going to tell you that I, I don't know enough about legal systems anywhere else. I have a good friend who's a lawyer. The entire legal system in the United States is not based on secondary or tertiary references. It's based on primary references. They always go back. There's not any, there's not any kind of academic pursuit to understand past history that does not rely on primary references except for Wikipedia. I still use it though. All right. The problem with that was, this is so far off, I was trying to correct something I knew that was wrong. So I went in and corrected it and I put the primary references in and I thought it was good. And I went back to check and it was completely wiped out. Did that three times. I thought I didn't save it good. Then the, the Wikipedia war started because I was using primary references. All right, so back to science and off of my soapbox. Um, so the, the first 16-sRNA to actually be sequenced, which produced the whole idea about life being in three domains. Charlie likes to say they're just two branches, but most of the other uh, phylogeneticists consider that there are three. Showed that, and this is Carl Woese. Any of you ever heard of Carl Woese? This is George Fox. He was my uh, mentor in, in grad school. They were before we really had good ways of doing sequencing. They chopped the actual RNA into pieces. Now let me tell you about that a little bit. This may seem like I'm going on and on about biology, but if you're not in biology, you need to appreciate sort of how biologists have to work. If you're going to extract RNA from a cell, just the proteins, remember we talked about proteins on your hands, will actually destroy the RNA. RNA is extremely, it, it's extremely um, fragile. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing how well it does its job as fragile as it is. So you, just extracting enough RNA to, act, to sequence is a problem. Back then, nowadays when we sequence RNA, we copy the RNA in a cell into DNA first, and then sequence it because DNA is very stable. We don't have to worry so much about it. Back then they had to use the RNA. They chop it into pieces with enzymes and then they separate those pieces, particular enzymes that cut in a certain place, and they separate those pieces on a 2D electrophoresis gel. And then they sequence and catalog each one of these spots. Much different than the data I showed you earlier. And so this is when George Fox and Carl Woese presented the first paper that recognized that the phylogenetic structure of the prokaryotic domain, there were primary kingdoms, and this was in PNAS in 1977. If you go to Wikipedia, they don't have this listed. <laughs> All right, I'm not gonna say anything more about Wikipedia, hopefully. <laughs> All right, so here's the tree of life that they came up with. This is actually a new name. Back when George and Carl were doing this, they called this Archaebacteria because, anybody know the reason why this was, might have been called Archaebacteria and this was bacteria? Anybody know why? You know why. Do you know why? If you look at these through a microscope, these two things look very, very similar. 
I mean, you would lump these in the same category. These look very different. If you notice, this, eukaryotes, actually are almost anything you can see with your naked eye. These have a totally different way that they reproduce and the way that their genetic material is, is, is partitioned off in, in when reproduction happens. Eukarya usually have some sort of male-female sexual reproduction. There's usually a change in the number of genomes so that when the, the, the progeny gets together, they have the correct amount. So they, you know, that's what, that's what an egg and a sperm is. These are very different. These are clonal. These just multiply and divide. They increase the, the, the genetic material, they partition off, and they divide. All right. So these observations gave rise to what I mentioned before, what in the world is at the root of the tree, the idea of a last common ancestor, and the role of something that nobody even thought was going to happen was the role of horizontal gene transfer versus lateral transfer. So back when this was all, yeah. Okay, excellent question. I bet every single one of you were hoping I was going to answer that, right? Okay. <laughs> I see some head shaking. Think, put yourself back in this place, all right? So you're looking at a, a molecule, you're sequencing a molecule that every living thing happens, and you can tell that it has some very conserved regions, and it just makes sense. I mean, how in the world would you get something to go from being, being in, inherited through a, a, a downward line, you know, vertical, you'd, ha you'd have horizontal, you'd have lateral, you'd have, you'd have transfer this way. Actually, that's wrong. That should be regular. That's why that you asked that. It should not say lateral transfer because there's not really any difference that I know of. I wrote, that's a typo. You may see those later on in some of this presentation. I do that all the time. I'm known for those. Um, but let me explain horizontal gene transfer and then transfer that happens downward. So that's the downward transfer is just like what happens with you. But horizontal gene transfer means that if I'm sitting next to Charlie, somehow there can be genes that pass from me to him even though we're not even remotely related. That's kind of, how would that happen? How would you actually get that to happen? Do you think that happens very often in human reproduction? How many people think that would happen very often in human reproduction? Raise your hand. Good, good thinking. How many think that might happen in clonal communities? It definitely happens in clonal communities. So, sorry about that er error. So when we do these trees, um, remember this is sort of a burgeoning feel when this all happens. And, and so bifurcating makes sense if you are a sexual creature where there's male and females. But does it make sense when you have a clonal population of things? So clones, think about how just there's natural mutations that occur in the DNA material as it's being copied. That's just a natural thing that happens. That's what, hap that's what provides diversity. You don't have nearly the complexity that you have in eukaryotes when you're talking about archaea and bacteria. So you have these genomes, and they're making hundreds and hundreds and thousands and millions of copies of each other, and ever so often there's an error. It's just the way it works. It's just the way our machinery inside our body works. So does a bifurcating tree actually describe what a bacterial community looks like? Probably not, but it's the only way we know how to do it. We don't know how to make it look different. But we have to keep in our mind that because it is clonal, we're talking about so almost like a cloud, kind of like a cloud of organisms that have almost 97, 98% the same DNA, but because there's been changes over time, they're a little bit different. So that's the sex versus clonal, and then we have the rooting problem. All right, so um, there was a, there, during this time, there were some amazing people that looked at, well, really, 
this this showed the relationship here. Remember, I talked about how the problem of bifurcating, which is what this is here. This showed the relationship of the organisms that we looked at their 16S. But how do you know where to put the root? You could put the root here. You could put the root here. You could put the root anywhere. So how do you know? What kind of data do we have that will tell us where we can put the root of the tree? Because we want to find out what the last common ancestor looked like. What would you do? Anybody have any ideas what you would do? Look for the oldest piece of genome. That's a good one. Most common one. The, the, basically, the idea there is, well, whatever's the most common would be the most ancient, and that's where you would put it. That turned out to be a problem because there was so much conserved in all of these with that 16S. This is a 16S tree. Well, these guys, Peter Gogart came up with a wonderful idea. When sequencing got far enough along, they realized that you could track duplications of other genes, and those gene duplications would give you an idea of how old the organisms were. I, I thought last night, I tried to think of, a, of a, an example of that, and I don't know how to do that. Basically, it's the same idea that he said, except you're using a bigger data set. You're saying, okay, if I see that genes were duplicated, and I can see them in some of these older organisms, then I can start to place where that tree was when I track those back. It's a little hard to think about, but it was actually a brilliant piece of work that Gogarten did. And he's the one that actually placed the root of the tree here with these branches, the archaea being more closely related to the eukarya, and the bacteria sort of a separate branch. Now this is where Charlie and I were talking. He feels like it's just two main branches, this one and this one. But most phylogeneticists will recognize that there's three main domains, and part of that is because there's still a prejudice, and I don't think it's unfounded, that we need to think about what these are like cellularly. Everything here has a nucleus that's covered by a membrane. It's very complicated. Nothing here has that kind of structure. The DNA is just in the middle, it, but it's not covered by a membrane. They look very similar. They have sex very similar. It's microbial sex, it's not that interesting. Um, the other thing then that came up out, and Charlie talked about this yesterday, was that most of these branches at the bottom, not here, but most of these branches at the bottom are thermophiles. So that gave rise to, we're getting more and more information that says maybe we have some idea about what this last common ancestor looked like. All right? All right, so <coughs> biologists love vocabulary. If, you, if, if you're not a biologist, the only reason you possibly could not be just terrifically interested in biology is because we have so many words that nobody knows what they mean. So this whole last common ancestor then brought up a whole repertoire of new ways to think about what that might be. So maybe, maybe what we're looking at is the last universal common ancestor. So in other words, not the very last common ancestor, but the last one here. Maybe we're looking at the last universal ancestor. Maybe we're looking at the sin ancestor. Maybe we're looking at the most recent common ancestor. This becomes a little bit clearer when this, this is what we're talking about here. The most recent common ancestor has to be what that most immediate branching there is pointing us to. But maybe you had other lineages here, and we're not actually, we, maybe we're never going to get down to here, the last universal common ancestor, because this doesn't give us enough, enough information. Does that make sense? That thinking makes sense to you? Okay. So, these are the properties that are shared 
by all of the most recent common ancestors. So we've taken all of life, all of extant life. Remember, we're doing the bottom-down approach. We've looked at all of life, and we said, everything we've looked at has these things in common. Genetic code based on four nucleotides. Three-letter codons, that's what makes the amino acids. They have DNA repair system. These are, these are little machines that actually copy the DNA. There's a single-stranded RNA, that DNA, RNA, protein plan. There's the genetic code is expressed in proteins. There's ribosomes. All of them have the same, you know, I told you follow the money yesterday. <laughs> everybody, everybody on this planet uses ATB as the energy currency. That's how they make life. There's lipid bilayers as a cellular membrane, and the in intracellular sodium is, sodium is lower, phosphorus is higher, and maintained by ion pumps, and there's cell division. Bottom line, the last, the most recent common ancestor that that tree points to is extremely complex. Do you think that gets us to the origin of life? I mean, we're talking that's like saying, well, I don't know, I don't have an analogy for that. I, it, it, you, we're looking at something that's already so complex, even though we can reduce it to the, the, the most possible, the, limp, the smallest amount of things that are alike, it's still extremely complex. All right. I don't think I want to go over that one. Okay. So the ancestor was hypothesized based on these gene trees and the genetic dis distance between living cells and fossils to be around 3.5 to 3.9. This is from back in 2004. I don't know how much new might have been come up on that. But the pot, so this was just trying to time when that last common ancestor I told you about appeared. So you heard yesterday about different, different time limits of when uh, the origin of life might have happened. This is saying when you, when you already had a complex organism in play. The past possible caveats to that are some lineages went extinct, and we can't, we can't, we can't sequence them because they've gone extinct. The genetic heritage of all modern organisms derived through horizontal gene, gene transfer among an ancient community of organisms. This is, this is another thing. Because we're using that bifurcating tree, you're, you're, already, you're already sort of, you're already setting yourself up for thinking there was just a single organism back there. That may not have been the case. It may have been the case that there was a whole community of things. The one thing that Charlie and I agree on, we decided, well, there were two things. What was the one thing? We, we, we think, we, we believe in humans. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is that we believe in, oh, three things. We believe in oxygen, too, but we also believe that there's community. It's clear that life on this planet is community. It is not individual, separated, pure cultures of things. That never works. Humans sometimes keep trying to make that happen in certain ways, but that is not the way biology works. So this is taking into account, okay, maybe we had a, a whole community at that beginning, at that time, and we've just lost, some of the lineages went extinct, but maybe we also are just seeing an event that happened among a community, and we don't have this last pure common ancestor. And then, of course, panspermia raises its ugly head once again. You know, maybe we just had something drop off into this planet. Um, Hervé's not here. I just want to make sure. I'm not trying to push panspermia on you. <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you the, the, the pros and cons that have come up in any of the conversations about this. All right. Yes. That's right. That, I mean, that's that is the negative side of this. It's it's assuming, it's a, it's making an assumption that we almost had to make because of the way we're explaining the data, but it doesn't mean it's the correct assumption. But it does get us somewhere with it. It. Yeah, yeah. You understood her question. It's a wonderful question. I mean, what you're doing 
what you're actually doing without realizing it, you're following along with the way this thought process went as this was happening. I mean, you're good thinkers, you're scientists, that's why you're sitting in here. So you're actually coming up with, well, that doesn't seem right, so how do we accommodate? How do we accommodate or fix that? These are all questions, and unfortunately, a lot of them are still around. I mean, the, the bifurcating tree works wonderful for most eukaryotes, but for simpler organisms, and I use that sort of dangerously, for simpler organisms like archaea and bacteria, it's not, it's not sufficient, it doesn't work. And we know from the fossil record that those things were around before there were complex animals around. So it, it, it's a problem. So there was a way to think about this. I just brought this up because this is another, so people all over were trying to figure out how to accommodate all these issues that we were having. So there was a group, Forterre, Patrick Forterre, said, well, let's get simpler. And this, was, this is, again, sort of a, a take on the RNA world, which yesterday I gave my own prejudice. I said, I don't know how robust the RNA world is right now. It's certainly, it's certainly clear that we're going to have to include proteins in that RNA world, but you still have the problem of not having an environment or an ecosystem described there. It's still very complicated. But this was, did I already do that? No, I went backwards, okay. So this was for Terre's idea. Let's, let's think about the RNA world, but let's think about it as sort of a two-story thing that includes viruses. So again, we're still trying to figure out what's going on down here. This is where we're at thinking that maybe the RNA world was somewhere in here, if it was a thing. So maybe what happened was in the pre-RNA world, you had all of these, these, these bars are just options. These are, this is the diversity of the RNAs in the pre-RNA world, right? It's just, it's just trying to give you an idea that there must have been several options. Most of them weren't good for life to get started. So one of them goes extinct, but one of them turns out to be able to do replication in the cell. So it's a winner. It won the odds, just randomly. Nothing, nothing was designed, nothing was you know, prescribed. This is just by chance, it happened. So that's the first stage of the RNA world, and it, it begets, a whole bunch of other options. The RNA world, I tried to tell you yesterday, the RNA world works only if you have lots and lots of choices to choose from. It doesn't work if there's only two or three things. You have to have a whole lot of choices. All right, so then what happens is this first replicating cell which is important, you know what replicating means. It means it's able to copy itself. It's able to make more copies of itself. It makes copies, and while it's doing that, it makes errors, like I mentioned, a whole bunch of them, billions of them. One of them goes extinct, these others hang around, but one of them comes up with the invention of the ribosome, and it's the winner, because now it can actually produce proteins that are coded for. And then that's when you have this is just a, it's as much a thought experiment as anything. This is when you have the winner, that ends the first stage of the RNA world, and then the same process again, but then you come up with the first replicating DNA cell. Again, it's, it's someone trying to figure out how to, to extract as much data from what we have from extant organisms and extrapolate back to what might have happened during the origin of life. All right, so I mentioned the horizontal gene transfer, which is lateral transfer. Confounding the picture of this whole three domain idea was the concept of the last common sense ancestor is the reality of horizontal gene transfer. Nobody expected that to be happening. I mean, literally, nobody thought that there would be that kind of transfer. So quick facts. When you do phylog phylogenetic reconstruction, on that 16S ribosomal RNA, remember that's the identity molecule for everything, it's what, there's over two million sequences. About 99% of the time, you do not see horizontal gene transfer. 
Now, some of you ought to be thinking, well, how does she know that? How does she know that it's not horizontal gene transfer? I mean, I kind of told you what's going on here. I showed you DNA sequences, and you say, well, how does she know that? I'm going to tell you. So one of the pioneers in all of this was Margaret Dayhoff. She's called the mother of bioinformatics. Based all of her metrics, all of her designs, all of her thought process on the assumption that genes do not move across horizontal lines. That was pretty, there's nothing wrong with her thinking that because based on the way humans and eukaryotes have sex, you're, never, you're almost never going to see a horizontal gene transfer event. Do you know, um, do you know why that's the case? Let's talk about that for a second. Everybody likes to talk about sex, so let's talk about that. You're supposed to laugh at that. Do you know why? If you want to get a gene transferred into your body that then has to be passed down to your children, where does that gene have to get to? reproductive cells it has to get into the sperm or the egg so I have cystic fibrosis in my family my sister died of that I don't know if you know what cystic fibrosis is it's it's one of the most unusual well it's not most unusual but it's it's a it's a highly uh, workable genetic inherited disease because it's usually part of just one gene issue. There's usually just one error in, the, in one gene that causes the disease. Both parents have to give it, so there has to be an error in that gene in both parents, and then the child will get it if they get both of those copies. So it's really a wonderful target for gene therapy because you only have to, most cancers, most, most anything has multiple genes that are involved in it. This has just one. It's curious what it does. It just messes up, you know, I showed you that ribosome. It messes up one part of the protein of a sodium channel. And it causes that channel that lets sodium go in and out be so malformed the sodium can't go in and out of it and it affects their lungs and their gastrointestinal system. In, the, in America, I'm not, sure it's, um, I'm not sure what the prevalence is in all different cultures, but in America they tell you, you just taste your child when your baby's born. After a couple of months, you taste your child, and if their skin is salty, then you need to go check them for cystic fibrosis, if you have certain other things, because the sodium channels aren't working. Um, so in order to get a horizontal gene transfer event into a eukaryote, it has to somehow get into the egg or sperm so that it can be passed down. That's a big barrier travel. Not the case, not the case with clonal organisms. Now we'll talk about that in a minute, but how do you find horizontal gene transfer? All right, so what you do is it's interesting, and I, I don't know, Charlie's probably going to ask me how come this is true, and I don't know the answer to this. Different genes, including that 16S ribosomal RNA gene, have a different percentage of two of that four-letter alphabet. So in, in DNA, you have G, C, T, and A. So certain genes have basically a signature of a certain percentage of G and C. They all will. If you look at the 16S RNA, there will be parts of it that will have a sort of a standard amount of G and C. You know, like we talked about carbon 12 and carbon 13 yesterday and how that all works. Sometimes in nature there's just handy things like that. So one of the things you can do is when you look at a whole bunch of sequences, and 25 of them have a certain GC percent content, and one of them doesn't, it's a good indication that that gene has been horizontally gene transferred from some other organism that had that GC percent content. Does that make sense? I don't see a bunch of nods. 
Let me go over it again. It's just, it's just lucky. Sometimes in science, when you run experiments, you're just lucky. You just have something that actually signals. And what it's saying is the particular two, two parts of that four-part alphabet are overly represented or underrepresented in some genes. And you can use those to track to see if a piece has come in from somewhere else that has a different percentage. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, yeah, the species most of the time are related, but sometimes it doesn't have to be, depending on the, depending on the gene that you're looking at. It's complicated, but I mean, that's why we have the computer scientists involved. <laughs> then there can also be phylogenetic incongruencies for more ancient events. Now, this is tricky, so if there was a lawyer in here, I told you I have a good friend who's a lawyer, and so he's kind of changed the way I think about things because... Um, just listening to how he runs a trial and stuff, I have a I have a different appreciation for the way we argument, uh, w the way we argue things. What happens is you have to, in, in order to have this kind of thing show you a horizontal gene transfer event, you have to have a standard by which to compare. So if you're going to take and look at a gene to see if there's been horizontal gene transfer in it. Any gene, not having to do with that 16S, but just another gene. A gene that fixes nitrogen, a gene that um, mm, anything. And you want to see if there's been a horizontal gene transfer event in that, then you have to have some goal standard in which to compare that to. You're going to compare the DNA, you're going to compare the relationships and see which one looks different. Does that make sense? All right. So what would you use as the gold standard if you're the one, the bioinformatics person doing this? I'm going to have to step out there and get closer to y'all to see if you can. Somebody tell me. 16S. That 16S is the gold standard. That's the one that tells you. Because remember what I told you? How many times do you find horizontal gene transfer in that after 2 million? Almost none. It al it's almost never horizontally gene transferred. Anybody want to think about why that might be the case? It's just too important. It's too important in that little ribosome. It's, that's part of the structure of that ribosome. So to bring a piece of that from somewhere else, from another ribosome that has slightly different places, it just doesn't fit. So the gold standard then is used, and I'm sorry you can't see this very well, but all this is saying is that this is a 16S tree, and when we see relationships mirrored here except for a few instances, we can assume these are horizontal gene transfer events. This becomes really important when we start thinking about what the last common ancestor looked like from a genetic perspective. How's my time? Okay. I only have like 82 more slides left, so y'all can just skip coffee. Come on. I'm not going to make you skip coffee. <laughs> we'll do just a few more of these, and then we'll have some questions. All right. So here was the revised tree. This is showing you what an uh, artist's rendition and a thought experiment might be. It, since we understood that horizontal gene transfer was happening in other genes, what if we looked at how 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 certain could we be that everything that we were trying to trace its history whether it's a 16s or another protein how how confident could we be that we can actually find the right family history for that particular protein or that particular gene if there's horizontal gene transfer happening how can how how confident can we be that we're going to be on the money about it. Well, one of the two things that really, to me, were spectacular in this was something called the endosymbiotic theory. If you know what that is, raise your hand. Ah, nice. Don't you think that's one of the most amazing things nature has done? So let me explain to you what happened. And Charlie talked about this yesterday a little bit. So it's curious. You, you know that in plants there are plastids, right? So the plastids are the things that are actually producing the oxygen. They have the photosynthetic apparatus in them. 
they're part of the photosynthetic apparatus. They're in plants, and they're also in algae, and they're also in something called cyanobacteria. Do you know what cyanobacteria are? Do you ever go to the health store and they tell you, let's eat some blue-green algae to make you do, make your oxygen better, or make you do better? I'm sorry to tell you that's not doing a single thing for you, but those cyanobacteria are real bacteria that do photosynthesis just like the trees do. I mean, it's credible. Well, inside, well, sorry, inside those plastids, they have remnants of that ribosome in it. So what does that mean? They have the 16S gene in them, right? So what can we do if we sequence that 16S gene? What then do we do with that 16S gene sequence? We're going to compare it to every other 16S gene that we have, right? And your expectation is that that 16S gene is going to fall right in with the trees and whatever else. It actually shows that in the trees, it's the, the 16S gene in the plants is very, very similar to the one that came out of cyanobacteria. So what happened at some time in the past, plants, primitive plants of some kind, I have no idea what that looks like or what they were, Maybe they engulfed a cyanobacterium and it became to their benefit to actually incorporate that and it eventually became an organelle in, in the plant itself. I mean, I don't know if there's any evidence that, that, that negates that. Do you think, is there anything that you know of that negates that endosymbiotic theory? I mean, they still call it a theory, but I don't know how, I don't know how you would explain that. There's no other... One time I'm, this is the one time I'm not going to show you any kind of caveats to this. I don't know of any. The 16S that's in this plastid, that's in this plant, looks exactly very close to the ones that come out of cyanobacteria, the 16S in cyanobacteria. So at some time in Earth's history, plants somehow incorporated this and turned it into an organelle in their bodies. Same thing happened, but with less clarity, for a bacteria that gave rise to mitochondria. Th this is less, for, for several reasons, this is le slightly less um, certain as this is. This is just clear cut. And this is, a good, this is a good adaptive reason this happened. One of the most spectacular things, and maybe we'll get to talk about this a little bit to me, most spectacular things for me, maybe we'll get to talk about it tomorrow, is photosynthesis. I mean, photosynthesis, w an innovation that happened by chance, probably early in our life, in our Earth's history, free lunch. I mean, who wouldn't want a free lunch? All you have to have is sun, CO2, which we had, and water. And you can make oxygen. I mean... I was telling somebody, it might have been Charlie the other day, there's a, one of the guys I went to grad school with, you know, we're all trying to find alternative energy sources, right? So they're, some, they're, they're trying to figure out somehow to get cyanobacteria. I don't know how, I don't even know how you think about this, but they're trying to use cyanobacteria or a photosynthetic organism as the power, the energy cell in a car. I mean... You basically have, you don't have to worry about anything that's coming out of that reaction, and you don't have to worry about anything coming into it. It's a free lunch. We would all get to drive our cars anywhere we wanted to go all the time. Don't have to pay any money. So I can imagine, I can only imagine back whenever photosynthesis, and it's a complicated system. I mean, it is, as beautiful as it is, as much as a free lunch it is, it is a complicated system. Whenever that, whenever that innovation, evolution brought that innovation on board, and I can only imagine that it had to be, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, you know, oh, it wasn't something that just happened. I imagine there were several, several attempts at something like this, but once it happened, it spread. Uh, I think we're getting close. So this was just to give you a little bit closer view of that. So this will be my last slide, and then I'll take questions. 
So you must have, you had to have been thinking this whole time that I've been talking, well, how in the world does this horizontal gene transfer happen? We talked about how it doesn't happen in humans, but now we're going to just briefly go over how it happens in a clonal community. So it can happen with bacterial transformation, which is a donor cell. These do not have to be related. A donor cell releases its DNA, and then it goes into a recipient cell. That's one way. That's called bacterial transformation. If any of you have ever talked to any molecular biologist, we use this. This is the workhorse in the mobile lab. lab. This is how we get things. If you are a diabetic, this is how we make insulin for you that's human insulin. We have put the human insulin gene through bacterial transformation into bacteria and have them just produce those things, just produce that enzyme, produce that protein over and over and over so you can have it as human rather than pig insulin. The other one is bacterial transduction, which uses phages, think viruses. They go in here, they infect a cell, they get a little piece of the DNA, they go in and infect another cell, these are usually a little bit more closely related, and then they inject that foreign piece of DNA in here, that's horizontal gene transfer. The third one is b bacterial conjugation. There's a transposon here, which is usually on a particular little piece of DNA, and it gets passed into a recipient cell. Those are three ways that we use all the time in the molecular biology lab to create horizontal gene transfer artificially. They happen all the time in nature. DNA can be exposed to an ocean environment and it can last for over 24 hours, 48 hours, just naked out there. RNA, not that. So let's stop there and we'll ask questions. Sorry. <laughs> I use my privilege as sure. chair and sure. ask the first question. Now, some of my students from astrobiology, they are standing right here, and uh, previous students I had. And in the course, when you refer to this, I think the diagram you show, you show two slides before that. Could you, could you put sure. that on the screen? Okay, this one, this one we do. And then wh what good remains f for the Luca concept under this caveat that you just exposed, because I, about half my students, they are biology students. And so they are, I, I would use the word indoctrinated in this idea of the LUCA. And I tell them, because I, I read the papers, and I read Lunini's book, for example, you know, the LUCA concept has a few problems, a serious problems. How can you hope to recover one single organism one single identity after all these problems you just described, and I tell them this is a very problematic concept. You should let go of it. It's an interesting concept, but reality was certainly much more complicated. Did I say anything stupid, or I am conveying some sort of no, he's good com stance? He's conveying you wisdom. You know, well, he's not quite as old as I am, but he's older because than most of Mika, you. Mika, the <laughs> biology <laughs> students, they, they are pressuring me. Gustavo, give me a reference about this outrageous statement that you just made oh, it's not about the no. uselessness of Luca. They, they, are, they are pressuring me. They, they write me emails. What's the reference that you promised? Can you give me a reference? Um, <laughs> I don't know if I can give you a reference right off the top of my head. Don't go to Wikipedia. I said I wouldn't say that. I won't. <laughs> um, so, this, so what you need to, as students, what you need to realize is that um, and this is what a lot of, you know, I come from the South in the U.S., so we have a lot of, um, you know, we're politically very divided in the South, and, and we have um, people that don't want to hear other people talk and people that are, are wary of science. Science works because we take data, and then we model that data, and we try to explain that data, and we do the best we can. And we're talking about people that have good thinking minds. There's nothing wrong with that because then we get the chance when we get more data or more understanding to go back and go, you know, we didn't have that exactly right. That, that's, not, that's not the way that, that doesn't fairly represent it or we have a serious error there. Now people that are not in science that are wary of science will tell you, well, that's because you don't know what you're doing. We're doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing. So in this case, to an that's the broad answer to answer his specific question. 
we were doing the best we could with this, this last common ancestor. It made sense. I mean, I explained it to you. It makes a lot of sense. But I've already told you there's issues. There are lots and lots of issues with that because when we start talking about clonal organisms, we're not even talking about a single individual. So it makes sense that the last common ancestor. So I suggest you and your students write the paper. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing, th that, that's part of how science should work. And it doesn't matter who you are, as long as you're a thinking person, jump into the game. Put your, put your thoughts in there. So you're, write the you're paper. You're forgetting about power and money. <laughs> well, I already talked, uh, power and money, you're still going to have to deal with that. Play the game a little bit. Um, I always said, you know, it just matters how far you want to prostitute yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, you know, life is what it is. And, you know, you're, you're in a business too. You're not, you're not just, you know, you don't have this big pot of gold over there that as a scientist you get to go over there and get what you need to work with. You have to work with the business part of things. But this is the vibrancy, this is the importance, this is why we have cell phones, this is why we do mission, we can send things to asteroids and, and comets and we can go to the moon and this is why we can, we can pe pe have people with diabetes have better insulin. I mean, these are things, this is coming out of science and it's a, it's a process, it's not just, you know, the final say so. So you have, you have a way to argue with others politely and kindly that this is science at work. I mean, this is, this is how things get done. This is how we've gotten the technical advances that we do. So don't be bashful about that. Step into the game. Okay. Okay. Ask, tell me to be your peer review reader and <laughs> I'll help you out. <laughs> Hi, Janet. Um, about five minutes ago, you said that uh, in reference to this diagram, yeah. that the endosymbiotic incorporation of chloroplasts was much more on firmer ground than the endosymbiotic yeah. incorporation of mitochondria. I hadn't heard that. What is that based on? Uh, I think my recollection, this has been a long time since I thought about it. I was going over it last night. My recollection is that um, it's, that's a, a much farther event in Earth's history, biological history. And so the, the sequencing of the mitochondrial 16S is not as the, it's the error bars are higher. That's my best recollection of that. Older. It's, oh, it's older. This event, th I'm sorry, this event, this is, you, you know, it's funny how images can, can predispose you to think something. This makes it looks like, man, there was, you know, a whole lot of time between here and here and then not much time. I have no idea how much time there was between this event and this event. But for certain, this event is older than this event. And we see that by the quality of our ability to look at the 60s in this compared to this one. That's my best recollection of that. If it's not true, it makes sense. So can use that. And, and there seems to be um, in this diagram from Doolittle, um, before, just before the mitochondria endosymbiotic event, there is a other single cell eukaryotes, the one beneath it. Yeah. And I'm wondering, are th is that hydrogenosomes or what are yeah, we talking so, about here? So what he's talking about there, pants are falling down. Uh, what he's talking about there, are there some, so when we start getting in, so I made, first, first of all, nothing in biology is simple. It's just not. <laughs> Humans aren't simple, and even simple organisms aren't simple. So what it turns out is, in the eukaryotic world, there are some branches on this tree, and these are not, this is just an artist's rendition. This is not to give you any kind of data acquisition here. There are some branches on the tree where they don't have mitochondria. You know, biologists are always, whether you're a or paleontologists, we're always looking for the missing link. You know, we're always hoping, you know, when we were looking at hominid evolution, you know, we had this idea that there was this progression, you know, you, you'd see, you'd just see this sort of classical, you know, well, this looks like an ape, and this looks a little bit less like an ape, and this is, you know, then we're gonna get into the hominids, and then you're gonna, have sort of this progression. Well, that's fallen through. That's not really the way it looks like our fossil record showing us. Same thing with, with these kind of simple organisms. So it turns out that there are some organisms that place low on the tree, so it looks like they're closer to the root, 
and they don't have they don't have mitochondria. So this was Sogan, Mitch Sogan out of Woods Hole, uh, really was sort of the pioneer of this idea. Well, that must be the ones before the mitochondrial event, the endosymbiotic mitochondrial event. But it turns out that <laughs> what they might have been is just sort of a reduced type of, they might have had mitochondria at one time and they lost them and, or they had something else that replaced them. It doesn't look like that they were actually mitochondrial lists. And I think my re recollection of that is that there was some indication for mitochondrial genes still left. So, so that last arrow the bot is wrong. It shouldn't be there. It's just an artist's rendition. So. <laughs> now, the caveat to that is, you know, we haven't, we haven't explored everything on the planet. You know, and some of these things are very strange. Some of these, where they live and what they do are very strange. Same thing over here, too. So who knows? We might one day find a missing link. But again, we're sort of still prejudiced towards this, I'm going to find this individual or this one single thing, and I'm a community person. I think, you know, I don't know. We're not representing what, representing what a community might actually look like. Eu queria saber como que se sabe diretamente como a diferença entre o que foi transferência horizontal e o que pode ter vindo por simplesmente convergência metabólica. Como que consegue diferenciar um do outro. Por exemplo, fotorreceptores surgiram várias vezes. E ela falou sobre o... É, é, não, é a mesma, é a mesma. Ela falou sobre a, a taxa de nucleotídeos, que dá para diferenciar isso. Mas a mutação não deixa isso meio que obsoleto? First part of the question. How can you really tell that horizontal transfer did not happen or did happen as compared to simple metabolic convergence? Say, p uh, organisms uh, making up the same solutions mm -hmm. to the same problems? Yeah. How can you distinguish That's between these? That's actually a great question. Um, I'm s I, normally, I'm pretty good at creating sort of a, something that's real life that you can compare to it, and I'm, today I'm not being able to do that. The genetic record of organisms has a complex history. There's lots of times when, in, in clonal communi communities, think about the fact that you have to, you have to be able to uh, control the, what genes are being expressed or used. So that's different in a, clon a clonal community, different in the bacteria and archaea than it is in humans. So in bacteria, which is what we want to concentrate on, an archaea is what we want to concentrate on because we think they're with the origin of life, you can have their, their control mechanisms, which are operons. You can have whole operons copied. You can have parts of operons copied. You can have single events copied. You can have certain parts of metabolism copied. You can have certain parts of photosynthesis. Well, the key then is for you to find those events, for you to find those so that you can start tracking back certain particular um, circumstances of gene expansion or gene loss in order to see to get a better record of it. I'm not explaining it well. I can tell by looking at your face. So maybe you need to, I don't know, maybe it's my English. Let me slow down. You can look it up in Wikipedia. <laughs> don't look it up in Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not every gene is going to give you the information you need. So you need to find events that are clearly events that either duplicated, they duplicated genes or operons or portions of, 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 a, of a particular machine and try to track those back through organisms. I'm going to give you an example tomorrow about that uh, with nitrogenase. But you just, you can't, you can't think that every, because the, the gene history is so complicated, you cannot expect every gene to tell you what it needs to tell you. You can look at specific genes or specific groups of genes or specific way genes are organized in an organism to see when horizontal gene transfer has happened. Does that make sense then? A little bit better maybe? Sort of, yeah. A second question? Last, last question. 
Hi. Hi. Thank you for the lecture. You're by welcome. the way, uh, I get a question about what is that Korar This one. This one. Yeah, but uh, because it does not seem like it's a bacteria and not even <laughs> another thing. <laughs> That's an know. excellent question. One thing I'm going to say. Now, remember, how many times have I said this is an artist rendition? Okay, this is not a data slide. This is an artist's rendition to give you an idea about how somebody is thinking about this problem. But it's based on data. So what happens is this whole archaea here, this is a really interesting group of organisms on the planet. A huge number of organisms. And we used to think that these were just in extreme environments. That's how they, that's how they first, that's how George Fox and Carl Rose first actually discovered that three domain thing. I think somebody brought them a sample from the Great Salt Lake, and it looked like a bacteria. And they sequenced it with the way I showed you, and lo and behold, it was a completely different thing than bacteria. It clearly was different. I mean, George is fun to listen to. I mean, when the aha moment he and Carl had went, oh my gosh, this thing that looks like a bacteria is completely different. So an assumption was made, even by the name, that archaea were really, really old, that assumption was made, and that they were only in extreme environments. Well, archaea, like, I don't know how much of the, of the biota in the ocean that they compromise, but they're not limited to, to extreme environments. And they keep finding new archaea, sequencing their 16S RNA and maybe some other genes, and they keep finding some that are at the lower end, very close to the root of this tree. So they keep putting them there. So they used to have, when George and Carl were doing this, they had two main groups of archaea, this crinarchaeota and this euarchaeota. But now they have discovered this other low branching group based on 16S RNA. So it's more similar to this and less similar to anything else, so it falls out here. And so this is a third branch. This is, um, the artist shouldn't have put this in here because it looks like it kind of goes over here. That's not what that's trying to show. It just, it comes, it stems from here. You wanna hear something interesting? You know bacteria, anybody ever had a bacterial infection in here? Yeah, you know, do you ever had spoiled milk? You know, so, you know, bacteria, Unfortunately, they get a bad rap because they do some bad things, but they do a lot of really good things. There's not a single archae, bacteria, archaea, archaea that causes disease. Just a fast fun fact. Go ahead. Well, let's thank Cannot Janet be for found this. on Wikipedia. <laughs> let's thank Janet for this great lecture, please.